Detecting and responding to threats in the cloud is harder than doing it on-prem. Even when you do have the visibility you need, legacy security workflows weren't designed for the speed and complexity of cloud environments. Cloud-native security solutions from ExtraHop are purpose-built to spot threats across the hybrid attack surface, provide detailed investigation steps, and help you automate response. Request your 30-day free trial at securityweekly.com forward slash ExtraHop. When it comes to modernizing identity, Active Directory just makes everything harder, from managing access for contractors and departing employees to securing cloud apps and on-prem systems. Your company deserves better. Choose Okta, the modern identity platform that securely connects anyone that touches your organization to any technology they want to use. Okta reduces AD vulnerabilities, secures not only employees, but contractors and customers, simplifies domain consolidation, and reduces your attack surface. To learn more, visit securityweekly.com forward slash Okta. Welcome back, everyone, to Enterprise Security Weekly. We're looking forward to attend Secure World Boston, uh, unless there's breaking news that that too is... It, it's not. It's still on, as far as I know, March 25th through the 26th at the Heinz Convention Center. Um, this year's theme is Animal Defenses of the Animal Kingdom. Interesting theme. Security Weekly listeners save $100 off the registration using the discount code Security Weekly. Uh, always fun. SecureWorldExpo.com is the registration link. Security Weekly is the discount code. Make sure that you check it out. It's a fun conference. Uh, we typically attend every year. Uh, was there another announcement for this segment? I didn't see one. Maybe there is. Is there? Okay, cool. We got it. Now I would like to introduce our guest for this segment, Mr. Corey Thune. He's one of the co-founders over at Gravwell. And today we're going to be talking about the pain that's caused by bad pricing models in cybersecurity and analytics tools. Corey, welcome back to the show. Hey, yeah. Great to be here. Always, uh, always a joy to chat with you folks. Yes, nice nice to have you. Uh, we're having a great actually conversation on uh, during the break about how to... Uh, figure out all this pricing, right? Because you got to pay for the licenses of the software. You got to pay someone to host it. Uh, you got to pay for storage. Uh, there's lots of costs that are some are apparent, some are not, and also different models to choose from. So, uh, Corey, I guess uh, get started by kind of give us an overview of both bad and good pricing models, in your opinion. Yeah. Yeah, actually, I want to. Uh, I'll jump into that because um, at RSA, uh, sort of recently, I had a couple of really good conversations with some folks, uh, which is is good. I, I always dread going to RSA mm. because I feel like it doesn't give value. But then when I go, I always end up getting value. So I don't know why I have this problem, but I do. Uh, it's a personal <laughs> failing. Uh, but maybe I wanted to start out uh, actually and and kind of get Matt's take on on a sort of a pre topic of with with what the market is doing and uh and, you know all the concerns right now how much does uh does uh security tool pricing and that kind of a thing affect what enterprise are doing with uh, security budgets how long does it take for that kind of thing to uh to cycle in or get factored into things yeah i mean the challenge i think for most enterprises is you know uh they're on a budget cycle they look at an investment and want to get three to five years out of that investment. Mm -hmm. So for, for some enterprises, the challenge is when you try to change the pricing model for one of these security products, it impacts their overall budgeting process either in that year or how they're going to end of life and replace a product down the road. Um, so those are some of the interesting aspects on the enterprise side. And to, to, the, to the point, right, one of the things Paul and I looked at when we were at Tenable was potentially changing the way Tenable was priced. Uh, because in the scanning space, it's based on the number of IPs. <laughs> well, IPs are hard to track. How many do you have? Right. You know, it gets a little difficult. And so I made a proposal. I said, wait, why don't we do like a, uh, like a consumption-based model? Well, consumption-based models scare both both parties, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Potentially scares the vendor because they're like, wait a minute, I like prepaid annual revenue because I can predict, you know, what my revenue stream is going to look like, especially when you're a public company. Mm -hmm. And on the and on the customer side, they're like, wait a minute, I've got to put in a budget 
And if I exceed this budget, now I got to go back and get money. So consumption models don't really work for me. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we saw this move at one time around consumption, but I know it scares sometimes both the vendor and the and the customer. Right. Yeah. We um, when we were first uh, like when we were raising money in our seed and and initially working, um, that was one thing that we fought uh, and, and went to bat for with with some investors because they encouraged us to. I'm sort of stick with some of the pricing models that the the analytics market has right now, uh, which is uh, I think that there's starting to see a shift just because it's anybody can kind of see that this is not uh, tenable to uh, in in the next five years. Uh, but um, uh, yeah, this this whole like you pay for every bite that you're going to put in a system, right? And uh, and so yeah, I was kind of curious how you know current recent events and things would maybe impact uh, impact how that works. Uh, for enterprises in the in the coming bit as well, um, just because I I uh, don't have a lot of personal experience there, uh, but um, yeah, it, it, at at uh, at RSA I talked to one of the conversations that was really interesting was uh, was sort of along this vein. So I went to uh, one of the vendor parties and it was kind of after like a long day of already socializing, talking to people. I was meeting with a bunch of people, and uh, I'm a bit of an introvert, and so when I go to events like that, I I I. F- I admit that I do some profiling, uh, and I look around and I see a bunch of people in suits and 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 stuff. And then there's like the one guy with like tattoos and a backpack and whatever, right? And I go, okay, that guy's a hacker. Uh, he actually puts his hands on a keyboard and does stuff, right? So it was at this point in the day, where I'm just like, I don't want to talk about any more high level stuff. Uh, I just want to talk to some dudes at a keyboard. Let's just tr- you know trade war stories over some beers, and then I can go home and go to bed. Um, but I wasn't talking with with uh, this guy who was um, who was uh, actually was a developer, and then he had a coworker that was uh, on the QA side, and then a coworker there that was like the SRE or, or liability engineer um, uh, stuff. And so the team of them, uh, we were kind of talking, and and I didn't lead with uh, any sort of pitch or whatever. I just wanted to talk shop. Uh, so I was asking them about, you know, their day to day. What are the things that they are they're doing? Uh, how are they enjoying the conference? That kind of thing. Uh, but pretty quickly, it kind of got into my wheelhouse, which maybe is because I'm biased as well. Uh, but uh, but they hit on 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 a a conversation that they were uh, having internally, where the um, the dev started talking about um, logs or wanting to be able to do stuff. And these this particular company was uh, a Splunk customer. And the SRE guy is like, well, just put it in Splunk. And the dev said, well, I can't because I, I, I don't get permission or something. And then, it, and then they turned into this fight between them about who they had to ask for permission. And sure, you can get it in. And uh, no, because they were worried about the license cap. And then uh, so it's like this, this internal struggle between the different teams who really should be kind of on the same mission, right? Uh, they should all be working together. They all want the same thing. They want the code to work. They want to help their business succeed. Um, but just because of his pricing model, not even anything else related to how the product works or whatever, uh, they, they weren't able to work together to get the mission accomplished. Instead, they're, they're fighting amongst themselves about, about how they are going to do the analytics, how they're going to find out where the bugs are. How, how do I get the stack traces? And, and at the same time as the guy's trying to keep the servers up and running and, and all this stuff. Um, which I think, uh, yeah, we're, I'm excited that the industry is kind of coming on board with this. Like, let's you know move into something that actually scales with the future. Uh, when when our dishwashers are producing data, we can't charge for every mm. byte of data that goes in. And so that was really uh, that was something that we fundamentally knew myself and Chris, my co-founder, when we when we started the company. And uh, it's it's uh, it's something that's becoming more apparent the more and more I, I talk to our customers, the more I talk to uh, people that that's uh, a big thing um, going forward because we want to help teams work together, right? We don't want to kick down silos, um, which uh, it, whether it's, you know, on-prem OT stuff, uh, cyber physical, because there's always kind of been some strife between OT and IT. Like there's these silos within organizations that I think prevent us from really succeeding in the mission. Yeah, and, and to your point, right, the pricing models have a big impact. Right, I should pull all my application logs and correlate them with my infrastructure logs and see what's going on. But if you're mm-hmm. in a model where it's consumption based, you've set a budget and you can't go above it, then you exclude those logs. Well, that doesn't help you find right. the attack vectors, right? I mean, it's just it's counterintuitive. 
Yeah. Yeah. Actually that turns into, um, I mean, kind of one of our earliest questions in qualifying leads or, you know, figuring out whether I, I don't want to waste somebody's time talking to them about sales stuff if, if it's not going to work. But one of the initial questions is like, are you putting, you know, are you analyzing all the logs that you want or are you dropping some on the floor? And nobody has ever said that they're analyzing everything they want, uh, which I, I guess I was kind of surprised about uh, going into this. Um, but, uh, but yeah, that's the, that's the reality of the situation is you've got, you've got struggles with uh, either just not being able to see it because it's in a different location or so you've got like kind of these multi-tenancy, multi uh, site issues, or it's purely pricing based, where they're they're not able to to do that because they're going to hit some ceiling on something. So, right, um, it's so, been pretty so, pretty exciting to work with that. So, how do we s- switch the model, right? Because because right now the challenge I think is the following: is I can't ingest all the data because the licensing restricts how much I can ingest and how much I pay, but mm-hmm. the value comes on the out outcome, the output side, mm-hmm. right? If I don't have all the data and do all the contextual correlations and really identify the stuff, then how do I know that I'm I'm fixing the right stuff, right? It's, it's so kind of funny. We need to drink all the booze and log all the things. I think is yeah. what we're coming yeah, to the conclusion. That's a good tagline. Yeah. You like you can you know what you should have t-shirts and stickers with that. You can have that free of charge. It's all I yours, get that Corey. One? You get all that right. one. Drink all the booze, log all the things. <laughs> this is our- I'm making shirts, um, but yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, that was uh, that's sort of one uh, area where I, I think we believe that that should change. And like I said, we struggled against uh, some of the investors that we were speaking with early, and we parted ways because that was one thing that we felt like that was a hill that we're going to die on. Because I feel like that's a, a sort of a uh, that's a sickness in the industry right now. Uh, I feel like because it 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 really fights against what. Uh, what companies want. And so maybe we're leaving money on the table, but I feel like this is the future. And so this is where things clearly need to go. Um, so a model that, uh, so we already have some unpredictability built in. Uh, like like Paul was saying earlier, when when you start moving things to the cloud, you're going to scale up for a while, you're going to scale down. Uh, you, you don't have a clear, like, I know exactly what this is going to cost necessarily. Right. Um, but that's on the infrastructure side. So if you tack on some unpredictability with your software licenses and uh, and everything, it turns into uh, it turns into handcuffs or, or what seems like is freedom turns into not that uh, because it seems like, yeah, sure. That way we you know, we we pay for what we use instead of. Uh, but but what, yeah, what ends up happening is it is it turns restricted. And so it's kind of one of those weird situations where uh, having. Uh, so what we do instead, uh, and I feel this is the right way, obviously, um, there's, I'm certainly up for discussing it, but um, what we do instead is we just say to hell with all of that. Um, we, we really encourage the put as much data in as you can, uh, and we just charge like on a per node basis. And then however much data you put into that node is your business. And where that has, I'll tell you an interesting area where that has uh, Maybe what what some would say has hurt us, but I would say has helped uh, people who would otherwise be un- unserviced is in the situation where you've got an organization, they're they're trying to do cybersecurity, right? Uh, they But right now, they don't really have a lot of retention. So if there's an incident, they're not even ready. Uh, like they don't have really good incident response readiness. And part of that is because the more data you put in something, the more you got to pay. Uh, but even though they're not necessarily using that data. And so what they'll do is they'll get a single node of us and then attach like a boatload of storage to it and put in tons and tons of data that just kind of, you know, has a, has a, a 90 day or even, you know, multi-year retention, especially for compliance type stuff. And they only ever pay for one node, but they, but it, it kind of is more of an incident response readiness type thing uh, because where our tool does really well um, compared to like Splunk or Elastic uh, right now is in like the forensics, the root cause analysis, threat hunting stuff where you've got your engineers in there, you're writing queries, you want to dig in and interrogate your data. Um, we don't have as much of the out-of-the-box whiz-bang analytics, uh, but that's coming, uh, and we got some cool stuff going there. Uh, so so those people who need like a, a ton of storage, yeah, usage-based is right out for them. They basically are are in the dark now, and they can't use any tools to kind of, they're, they're putting logs on a, on a server somewhere uh, and then hope that they can read them in, or then they're going to start threat hunting using grep instead of like uh, tools that can make their job easier. Which I is think an unfortunate uh, side I think of it. analysts should be forced to threat hunt using grep first for at least a couple of weeks to just see how nice they have it today. Because I threat hunted using grep 
back in the day. Yeah. <laughs> you want to hear, so, here's a funny story. Um, uh, the, so recently we had a capture flag event. Did I talk about this in our interview at RSA? I'm not um, sure. We, I don't think so. We, we had this capture the flag event at, uh, at, in Spokane. Uh, it was a really cool like thing for local universities or whatever. So we had a bunch of students, not cybersecurity students, just mm -hmm. uh, computer science students. And so the idea was like, hey, let's come in. We'll do a capture the flag. So we had some cool events. Uh, it's standard Jeopardy style CTF, right? And so I was there as a coach, uh, mentor, walk around helping people. Uh, it was really fun. Um, but one of, the, uh, one of the categories was logs, and I provided a bunch of challenges for this. Uh, and so I gave them like SSH logs as an example. Mm -hmm. I said, ah, here, you know, uh, here's a bunch of entries. Tell me how many failed. Uh, you know, it was like a brute force attack. And so kind of walked them through the steps of discovering this. Uh, but, but the vast majority of the students took the log and opened it in Microsoft Word and then used control F to, to be like, and they would like find fail. And then Microsoft Word would say, oh, matched you know, 600 lines out of, out of uh, 650. Uh, so then they would say, oh, there's 600 failures. And they're using Microsoft Word as a grep. Right. That's a, hunting tool. Uh, a lot slower than grep. And what's, yeah. you know what, and what's funny, though, is if you say, well, I could write a C program or a Python script or a Perl script to make this better and faster. When you do that, you realize that it's either the same if you're really good or probably much worse performance than grep and awk and sort and cut mm -hmm. because those tools have had so much development right. time in the past. Uh, I'll take a guess, maybe 30 or 40 years, 40 years, mm -hmm. maybe 40, probably 40, probably 40. Um, but what you, of course, realize is that you need a real analytics tool. Uh, and that's where we get the tools like Gravwell, right? That in, in other uh, threat hunting tools that are much better uh, for a whole lot of reasons uh, in doing that. Now, Corey, I want to just come back to you said uh, during the break that most of your customers, and I'm finding this a lot uh, across multiple you know, vendors, is they're hosting this largely on premise. Um, mm -hmm. which is interesting. I don't think there's anything bad, uh, in, you know, inherently about that. However, uh, I really just want to advocate for at least starting to move your infrastructure up to the cloud. Uh, an example, like right after the show, I have to go perform recovery, uh, on a, a raid array that failed here locally. <laughs> right? So there's yeah. that, like you don't have right. that level of responsibility any longer. And it's interesting. It wasn't a hardware failure. Basically, the file allocation table, I believe, is corrupt. So, like, mm -hmm. hardware rate is working great, but there's lots of other things that can go wrong with your systems, you know, not to mention having to physically house them and upgrade them. So, your infrastructure is much better suited. Now, to kind of speak to your earlier points, both you, Corey, and Matt, that the, it's the elastic portion of AWS and, and others' clouds that I think it make it very uh, uh, attractable to those that are performing incident response, right? Let's say you do have an incident, mm -hmm. and now I want to store a whole bunch more logs and do a whole bunch more analysis. Well, it can just auto-scale those volumes mm -hmm. in CPUs. That's something that is super hard to have locally, if not next to impossible to replicate what uh, you know Amazon has in their cloud. Oh, right. So, now, there's costs associated with that that you have to keep tabs on, of course, but I, I've so actually, personally, we've used that... Uh, technology to overcome some of the technical challenges that we had in in publishing our applications and really Gravwell and your security tools are applications that you should consider moving up into the cloud uh, infrastructure. Yeah, I I agree, and and that's one thing that we also realized from from the start. Um, our 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 tech stack is 100% written in Go. We're not we're not based on Elastic or or something, right? We purpose built yep. our stuff for this. Um, and one of the advantages we get with that is it's really easy to containerize our stuff. So there's mm -hmm. a Docker container for Gravwell uh, that acts as an index or node that you can deploy out that way um, exactly for that reason. Because there's some really, like you said, there's some really nice things that that the cloud brings. Um, but I think um, like there are certain aspects to on-prem that'll never go away. Uh, like anything cyber physical uh, is, yeah, is going to have an on-prem component by nature, right? That's where computers are affecting the real world. So that's going to be true. Um, and and I wonder, because um, on-prem is kind of cyclical as well. Uh, so right now, everybody, the cloud is doing a great job. Uh, like we went from mainframes to desktops, and now, now we're back to, you know, these data centers with the cloud stuff. Uh, but with Kubernetes, uh, it, it's, it's turning into, it's more possible for enterprises to 
sort of create their own cloud. And and sure. there's reasons and stuff for why anybody would do that. But um, but I'd be interested to see whether that pendulum swings uh, to the other way or not. But like you said, they should absolutely be taking advantage of uh, some of that auto scaling stuff. And and that's you know an advantage to our stuff with the pricing model as well, because uh, you can auto scale it uh, and uh, throw in you know, throw in more storage or more whatever, and we don't care. Yeah. Uh, we want to enable that kind of thing. That's a great point. Uh, I think with other solutions, you've got two costs to worry about, right? So if you're in the cloud and you have licensing fees that you have to worry about on top of your cloud costs, uh, that, that can be daunting. Like, how do you go get budget approval for, for you know, both of those, right? Mm -hmm. Whereas if you already have a presence in the cloud, you likely have some model to... Uh, you know, have budget and control costs and can make the mm -hmm. justification. And it, I, it just makes it a lot easier for teams to not be limited by technology in what they're right. collecting and analyzing, which I, I think is, you know, doing your analysts a disservice and your organization a disservice because yeah. you're going to miss stuff, basically. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And you talk about not being limited by technology. So that's another aspect that we think is pretty important. Like, I think a best practice for an enterprise would be um, like you want your data bus layer, your events uh, to be sort of independent from whatever you're using to analyze them, uh, in my opinion, because otherwise there's the risk of like super vendor lock in and then you're just you get the screws to you mm. uh, because you can't uh, you can't move or whatever, just because like your collection is tied to your analytics. And I think that it, in terms of best practice, like it would be a good idea to separate those two things. So if you like get all your logs into a Kinesis stream or something. Um, that makes it uh, you, then you can just hook whatever up to that Kinesis hose and then they can, they can deal with it. So um, Corey, uh, for myself and our audience, can you just give an overview of Kinesis? Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, I mean, I can, I can attempt, um, I'm certainly not an expert, but, uh, but the idea being like, uh, like, like it's a, uh, a, a hose or, or a cue that you can, that, that you can feed into, mm -hmm. um, based on your, you know, you've got your containers or your events and they can feed events into the hose. Uh, into the into the Kinesis stream, and then you've got consumers that can consume from the stream on the other end. Gotcha. Um, now, the main, is the Kinesis, main benefit. Sorry, Corey, is Kinesis uh, something specific to Amazon's cloud, or is it something you yeah. run? Yeah. So it's, the other okay. the other providers have their own versions, uh, and gotcha. there's plenty of similar type things like uh, S3 could, SQS yeah. uh, stuff. Um, you know, uh, there's different ways that you might turn your event or figure all that out, uh, mm -hmm. and then when you get cross cross cloud providers, then that gets even more exciting, gotcha, gotcha. Uh, which we've helped people do. Yeah. Uh, but also it illustrates like when you do have infrastructure in different cloud providers, having that um, sort of agnostic layer in the middle yeah, for how yeah. you're dealing with your events and collection, I think is pretty important. And so that's one of the kind of best practices that we encourage, which again, um, we think it's doing the right thing. Uh, it, it probably makes more sense from a business perspective to force people to use our crap. Right. So it's, it's a, a very generic kind of event uh, queuing system or, or collection system, I should say. Right. Like you wouldn't put your log files in some proprietary binary format that only one thing can read, right? That's absurd. But that's totally what we're doing when we talk about some of these collectors. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Some no. of the tools that people put out. So, yeah. So we say no, you know, put it in a, put it in a format that everybody knows how to read. So if you want to switch to uh, something else uh, or, or, or have or, multiple you know, things down or whatever. I uh, have multiple things reading from it too, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. And that's and that's uh, and that's something that we've absolutely done because um, we will come into customers and their sock is using uh, you know Splunk as an example. They're happy sure. with it. Um, they got their whiz bang stuff, and we're not trying to um, you know we don't want to break the machine if the machine is working. Mm. Uh, but often they they're not putting everything in that they want. And so, yeah, we can, you know, if you've got Kinesis or something, then we just drink, both drink from that hose mm -hmm. uh, or or whatever. And then you've got the stuff uh, in Gravwell sitting there in case you need to do some deep dive. Uh, yeah, well, that's a great strategy. Threat hunting or whatever. Awesome. Right. The collectors should be pretty open. Uh, your indexers get a little more proprietary. But again, yep. if, you, if you're shifting the model the right way, the goal should be I can send data anywhere pick and choose what I want to use to analyze the data, get as much data in as I can at a, at a price point that makes sense, not only to you, the vendor, but also to the organization who's got a budget for this stuff. Because yeah. again, they got to go justify budgets too. And if it's a consumption base, it gets a lot harder. They're going to start dropping logs on the floor because mm -hmm. at some point they're going to hit a cap. Yep. Yeah, that's our that's our philosophy. That's what we believe. That's what we set up our pricing model and the tech to do. Because uh, yeah, our collectors are open source. Um, you don't get into closed source until you hit the the indexer and the secret sauce that makes 
makes our performance so awesome. So um, that's that's what we want to enable. Absolutely, I think it's the right thing for for enterprises. And because because I was in the trenches, right? This is what uh, some of the stuff that, that myself and co-founder are engineers uh, as well. Like we've all been there. So that's what we're trying to fix. Fantastic, Corey. Thank you so much. Uh, if our listeners want to learn more and register for our upcoming webcast with Gravel, we'll, we'll dive into uh, a lot of the cloud logging, I believe, is uh, what's on tap for that uh, and how to actually do some of this stuff. Securityweekly.com forward slash Gravel. You can register for the upcoming webcast there. Absolutely. It'll be fun. We're going to look at some real logs. Yes, we, we, we've done this in the past with Gravwell and lots of our other sponsors as well. Um, you know, we eat our own, our own dog food and I don't know, that's a bad analogy. I hate that analogy, right? <laughs> but we, we take real problems that uh, we have uh, here at Security right. Weekly and we use our partners' uh, solutions uh, and show you how to do it. So looking forward to that, securityweekly.com forward slash gravwell stay tuned the final segment in this episode will be with extra hop and bandura interviews from the rsa conference <laughs> 